Do you feel as if reality has been altered? That something or someone has interfered with our collective present moment? Then this is the podcast for you. This is the sound of duality. This has the sound of a DMT molecule as it travels through your body, opening you to the knowledge that you seek. It's also the sound of sheep and bliss, wandering this universe and the concept of Sonder as you play a lead role created by these two states of being. Pull up a pew and take a seat. This is a podcast of all you touch and all you see. The guests are everything in between. Enjoy the ride. Enjoy the duality of each state of being and the very thin line between each. Oh, hi, everybody. It's uh, Drew with Pull Up a Pew Podcast. Today is going to be a very special day, and I have a very special guest on with me. Her name is Jessica. I want you to say hi real quick, Jessica, to say hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> there you go. I'm doing good. How are you? Good. You doing all right? I am. I'm doing well. Good. Very good. All right. Because as we know, um, this is going to be a multi-part series and uh, about an extremely horrific event that occurred in the 1980s and really is still occurring. But we're going to be focusing specifically on the 1980s because the situation was different. Jessica and I actually were part of a cult and uh, one of which I had escaped from and was able to provide the FBI, ATF, uh, and even um, Congress on a federal level through a congressional committee. Um, I was a minor at the time, but with uh, information in order to raid this place. Now I'm going kind of out of order here, but I'm just, just laying out the map, but there was others as well. It's not, not just me. There, there have been other people, uh, most of them boys who had, uh, escaped at one point or another. Uh, just the only difference is they were picked up, uh, very quickly, but they were able to start building a case and information about the Bethel Baptist boys home, boys and girls home in Lucidale, Mississippi, literally in the middle of nowhere, people. Okay. I want to also give uh, a di- couple disclaimers right now, real quick, and some warnings that this is adult subject matter. Um, there will be some other episodes that we can do that where if you want to involve your, your children, you can, and which you should, um, for some, for some reasons that we'll explain to you, but really this is, this is more for, for parents so that this occurrence never ever happens again in this manner of which we're going to speak about. Cause as I said, to some degree, it's still occurring, not just here in the United States, but really all over the entire world. Uh, this was actually on 60 minutes at the time it was on 2020. It was on almost every talk show circuit you could think of because they were calling me left and right. My parents to try to get me on, um, about the story of what happened after the raid. Cause of course nobody would have known about the raid until it had actually happened, except that, um, they were tipped off and we're going to talk about that as well because it adds to it. Um, but the, the point of this podcast, everybody, okay, and Jessica is going to tell you the same thing, is really two things. It's it's about healing. I'm going to be 50 years old this year. And, uh, you know, again, this all occurred a long time ago, but there are literally thousands of people that are still struggling with this, that are having 
uh, extremely difficult times in their lives where this, this literally ruined their lives, their entire lives because of what had happened there with the PTSD uh, from specific occurrences and situations that they were in. I know it did for me. Um, had a massive effect on my entire life to a um, very, very negative degree. But we, Jessica and I both see um, a lot of information out there that number one is not true to um, people that um, I've even seen some people that claim to be me um, at one point. It was at the same time and saying how they had escaped and did what I did. It was like almost word for word exactly what had happened to me. So it's about setting the, the record straight, setting a timeline, just getting the skeleton together here. And then we'll have, uh, again, continued episodes where we're going to drill down further and further because it's, it really is that horrific. And again, I need to stress that if you are disturbed by any information concerning sexual abuse, pedophilia, violence, um, or anything of this nature, that um, this is not for you. Or just go into it knowing that. Um, and also the language that we'll be using. The only word that I will not use, which was used at the time, which is the N word, which everybody knows, but in being in Mississippi and Alabama and that area of the country back at that time, it was, it was used quite frequently by the leaders and people within the cult and what were considered to be um, trusted uh, boys and, and girls. But really what they were were just brainwashed. And the reason they were able to do this is what's called compartmentalization. And that's how a cult is run. So this was like a mix between Jim Jones and Waco. And the only reason it did not end in that fashion, I believe to this day, and this is my speculation, I can't say this is fact, but it's how I feel, is because of the tip off. So it's actually a good thing that it occurred. And this tip-off came from a member of Congress. And I'm going to let everybody kind of, and again, because I cannot prove specifically anything, I can just, I have the information from the FBI people that I was speaking with at the time back in the 80s uh, explained what had happened. But you could probably maybe guess why this person would not want all of this information to continue and to snowball and get bigger and bigger and bigger because some of them were involved in certain aspects of this place, okay? Um, not everybody saw the same things, people. That's what needs to be uh, hit home, and we're going to keep hitting that home over and over again, that you saw what you were supposed to see, and that's it. You were chosen specifically for different reasons of how easy it was to manipulate you or not. Some of you were not as easily swayed uh, like myself. And there's a lot of um, corroborating evidence. I mean, that for the amount of evidence for what happened there between the violence, the sexual abuse, uh, it, this gets really bad, folks. And again, we're going to keep it light here on the first one. I don't want to go too far because it, it could end up triggering people um, mm -hmm. that we even are going to provide a suicide hotline and uh, treatment phone numbers so that people that are survivors of the Be Bethel Baptist uh, Boys and Girls Home can reach out. People that I know never have. People that I know had committed suicide after the raid because this family was not put into jail for the rest of their lives because they were committing these types of crimes, or I should say that the group was committing them. And again, I think that's a part of the compartmentalization that I'm going to bring up again and again and again, that the fountains, as we'll call them, we're not after them. This really isn't about them. You know, this is so long and so far away. Um, we're going to pro provide a little background info on kind of where they are and what's going on now. But, you know, we can't go back and change this. Just we can't. So there's no point in ranting and raving specifically about them 
but there was other people that were in charge there at the time while it was being run as a cult that were involved in the um, trafficking of children, uh, sex trafficking and, and pedophilia. And I'd even seen some things I was not supposed to see. And I will explain what happened to me on another episode because we are going to have to build this up and make sure that people, again, are prepared to hear um, what they're going to hear. And we'll have other people on that will corroborate everything that we're talking about. So the people that are out there bullying those that are online, um, you know, talking about their experiences and how bad it was and then saying, uh, you're lying, you know, this never happened to you because it didn't happen to me. Look, you are way too young to understand any of this. Your brain doesn't even develop fully until you're 25 years of age, okay? So to say that, you know, this didn't happen to the person of uh, and what they're talking about, especially when it matches up to 200 <laughs> other people almost word for word, like when Jessica and I got together and I found her online, we got on the phone and Jessica, we were finishing each other's sentences, weren't we? We were. It was insane. Yep. It's it, absolutely. I mean, we, we went to the same school, high schools here. Um, and this was all for a specific reason. If anybody remembers back in that time, uh, there was Tough Love and Hugs Not Drugs, two organizations that were very big that have turned out to be some of the biggest scams ever on the planet, uh, especially Tough Love, that was being paid to sway parents uh, that were not in touch with their children to send them to Bethel. So, you know, this is what was going on, and this is why parents were duped and why in some circumstances, you know, and that depends on your own circumstance, uh, but they can be forgiven because, again, this is very, this is orchestrated as to, to such a level that it's not just the kids that are being manipulated and brainwashed, it's also the parents. And in Jessica and, and my situation, it was to get to our parents' money because we grew up in a very wealthy area. And in fact, you'll end up hearing me talking about that. And it'll be the only time in my life where I will ever talk about how I grew up, who I grew up with, and the, and, and the money and the wealth, because I'm not that way. I'm not into that. I'm not a name dropper. I, I don't, I'm more about what are you doing today <laughs> as opposed to 30 years ago. Okay, that's not my life today. But it applies to the story. So that's why you will hear about these things and people that I grew up with. These are people that you're going to know immediately and families, but a lot of them have, have passed on. And so I'm okay with bringing them up. There's some that I just will not be able to, to, to say their names for obvious reasons for privacy, but it, it builds the narrative. Um, and, I, and there's one, I just want to look here. There's a, a, just a quote. And I want to let Jessica explain how it is that she found herself to be there. That's where we're going to kind of limit this episode to be is just explain just a little of how it is that we ended up being there and maybe in the first couple of weeks and then wait for the next one where we are going to have more people along with us to explain each individual horror and the truth behind it. Um, and there will be one article that I'll read from here just to set that tone so that people understand that this is as real as, as a heart attack. Um, nobody is making any of this up. And I'm sorry, again, I really am sorry to the people that did not have a problem. In fact, thank God you didn't. Um, you really should count your lucky stars, right, Jessica? I mean... Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. They, they, they really need to. Um, so I have definitions here. I'm just, uh, just give me one second, guys. I, I apologize. I just want to find this one statement here. Uh, let's see if I can find that's the background. Where is this one thing? Oh, 
Okay, here, okay. This, this gentleman, this is just one statement out of, again, th- literally, I, I said hundreds, but it's really thousands because there are many, 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 many videos out there concerning Bethel at different points of its um, existence, let's just call it. But while it was in its cult existence, again, we're going to call that the late 70s and into the 80s, and then into the raid that occurred in 1988. That is a specific time period that is completely different than everybody else's experiences moving forward from that, that were still bad and horrific, and we need to help them as well. But here's what he said. He said, I was at Bethel in 1984. I was 15 years of age at the time. I am now 37. This this is an, an older, um, I think this was from back in 2003. So you can imagine, you know, he's, so he's obviously that much older now, but he witnessed the abuse firsthand. And I don't care what anyone else says. I was there. I saw it. I lived through it. And I have nothing to gain here. I don't have a lawsuit pending or any action against Bethel. I will say this. The things that I am hearing and seeing here are tame. I can tell you true stories that are much, much worse. I was there in the early years when Brother Fountain Herman was in charge. Things were worse then. From what I am seeing posted about Bethel now, I have nothing to hide. My name is Michael. Patterson, who I'm actually looking for now because I'd love to get him on the show here. And I am from Nashville, Tennessee. Anyone who remembers me from Bethel or anyone who has any questions can email me. And I'm going to leave his email out. Uh, just keep that that private. But if you remember his name. All right. But I want everybody to focus on that statement. And I picked it because it's just so similar to everything else you're going to see in here other than the very few that say nothing happened. What are you talking about? This is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It, it, you don't get it. It doesn't matter because you were chosen not to go through this and to see it so that you could become trusted. And whether you know it or not, I'm sorry to tell you, you were brainwashed. That's why you're saying what you're saying today. And I don't mean that as, as a dig, folks. I don't. I love everybody. I, it's, it's about helping people. It's not about digging at you, but you've got to understand and study what brainwashing is, what cults are, how they affect people and everybody on a different level, depending on what niche where you were in. Like I said, Jessica and I coming from a specific area in Boca that Tough Love targeted so that they could make a fortune from our parents that when I got there, my parents gave, not knowing what this place was like, of course, but them, I'll just say in a very, very large sum of money, very large, okay? Way in, into the into the high tens of thousands or, or, or higher, let's say. And that's because they could not take um, this style, they got rid, they got um, away with a lot of things. They could not take a tuition because they're not a real school. So they took these quote, quote, donations. And we had to sign, my parents had to sign me over and give complete 100% guardianship to this asshole and family. I'm sorry, folks, you're going to hear some swearing. I mean, it's, it's very difficult. And when I was dropped off, um, you know something? Let me actually let Jessica talk now, and then I'll explain how I got there. I want her to kind of just introduce herself, what she's kind of doing now, and then and kind of explain how she got there, because this is going to all weave together. Why don't you go ahead and, and do that, Jessica? Okay, Drew. Um, actually, like you said, I got there through a, a tough love program. Uh, really, now looking back, it was really more that my um, stepfather didn't want me. Uh, basically what it was. My mother was very weak. I wasn't really doing anything as a teenager to warrant being sent anywhere. I was a straight-A student, uh, wasn't addicted to drugs, didn't use drugs, anything like that, but we had some family issues. They uh, started off by going to a private family counselor, and when my stepfather didn't like her advice, which was to my mother to get me away from him, we went on to the tough love group and 
of course, I didn't know about it at the time because it was just for, for parents. And the next thing I know, I ended up waking up uh, in Lucidale, Mississippi. <laughs> we had the same thing. So <laughs> Basically, we'll in a nutshell, that. that's, that's how it happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then my life changed, and not for the better. And when you went in, they, they shaved your head as well. This is all part of the indoctrination of what cults do. This is not for the reason, quote, of like what you'd think for a military school where they'd shave your head. Right. It's not. People confuse that. So much confusion out there again over what happened that I'll say what happened to me is I, again, we grew up in Boca. So did Jessica. And we even went to the same high school, Pope John right. Paul overlapping a little bit at that time and um just i'll just say growing up, up in boca at that time um you, you couldn't you couldn't help but be doing some drugs smoking some pot uh you know even experimenting into some cocaine and things and but i never got into that i actually i really never did and just like jessica said i was also really not a bad kid at all but i had issues i'm adopted I spoke about this on another podcast. Um, I had some very serious issues of abandonment running through my life. Um, many other things besides this. And then you could imagine what being dropped off at a place like this. You talk about abandonment that they took me um, when I got there. I'll say what, what happened is I was at boarding school in Vermont. I was taken out of, of uh, school here in Florida because I was just, you know, spending more time having a good time than, than studying, you know, just one of those, uh, um, you know, I was, I was bored with school. So anyway, so I went to boarding school in Vermont, a phenomenal school called St. Johnsbury Academy, um, went on the Dean's list because I didn't know anybody there, uh, didn't really have anything to do. So I just applied myself, <laughs> just got on the Dean's list. You know, they would take us to, to Montreal and, you know, we'd have all kinds of great times. And, and, uh, but then I kind of slumped back and my grades would, would, uh, drop. And, and, uh, unfortunately I, I would, I was sexually active at the time. I, I got a, um, a girl pregnant while I was there and the school found out and the school was actually fine. They loved me. Um, they were going to work this out, but I guess my parents figured, no, there was a huge generation gap. And my parents, they didn't adopt me until they were in their uh, mid forties. Okay. So just to give you guys an idea. And so same thing happened. Um, I flew down to uh, Atlanta. This was a, a close to what the Christmas break was for school. And then we were going to drive the rest of the way down here to Florida. I wake up in the car and I'm in Alabama. It's so kind of like, just like with Jessica, <laughs> I wake up and uh, here I am like, where are, what, what's going on? Not, I'm not, you know, I'm a little fool. Uh, we, we made a wrong turn is what they said. And I'm like, come on, you know, give me a break. And they're like, well, actually we found you another school. You've been getting into trouble. And I remember them arguing with them about it. And all of a sudden we end up at the mobile airport picking up one of these quote people from tough love, this big burly guy, um, that they recommend. That's how they do this is they send somebody or recommend that they bring somebody so that you can't escape, right? So we drove the rest of the way there to Lucidale and you pull up. I just remember this so vividly. I have a very, very vivid long-term memory. My short-term memory, forget about it, but my long-term is very vivid. And I remember a big, massive um, tree, like a willow. Jessica and I were talking about that. I can't remember what they're called, but they have the, the moss. When you go up in the central Florida and uh, into the panhandle, and into that area of the country, there's the moss laden trees. So picture if you've ever seen the movie Interview with a Vampire and the plantation house and the trees and the moss. That's really what it looked like. And so we went inside and went into the office and Fountain immediately grabbed me with my parents standing there. And I remember telling them to get the fuck off me. Um, and that's when he said, you will say yes, sir. And this and that. And, and I said, no, I, this isn't occurring. This isn't happening. I mean, I was, I was literally going, you know, my, my brain was splitting on me of the, you know, obviously immense amount of shock of what was going on. And so he and his son, Bubba, you can't make these names up people. Okay. 
you know, Herman Fountain, Brother Fountain, and his son Bubba. I mean, give me a break. Uh, but they grabbed me and dragged me uh, into a room just behind uh, where my parents were sitting and started literally beating the shit out of me. And I fought back very hard, punching them, uh, punching his son. Uh, they eventually hit me. Uh, they hit my, my leg and my foot, and I still have a bone that, that pops out. Uh, from my foot, from this occurrence. Um, and then from there, we went and had our head shaved uh, and then went to these barracks that literally, it was like Auschwitz. If you look at like the barracks that you would see there, um, you know, very, very similar to that, folks, for real. Okay, I'm not going to say exactly, of course, but it's very similar. Um, just broken down, at least the ones that I was in, I can't speak for some of the other areas, but the one that I was put in and that's when the brainwashing begins and I'm going to get into, we are both going to get into in a later episode about the techniques and what they did. And I'll just say this to start, you're not allowed to speak to anybody. I have somebody watching me there 24 seven. Um, and then they begin to decide where they're going to stick you into which category. Um, that's the compartmentalization of this that people don't understand to this day. A lot do, but a lot don't. And that's what we need to explain. And what I want to do real quick here to help everybody is um, just explain about what cults are about. And everything that you see here, if, if you went to the home, you know, you're, you're, you're going to recognize that number one, the leader is the ultimate authority. You know, Herman Fountain for, you know, for the most part had to have known everything that was occurring at this place, except for possibly a few things. And I have some additional information that would tell me that I believe there was also other occurrences happening behind his back with some of the other people that were in charge that would go more into the sexual uh, abuse side of things where Herman Fountain was more of the, the cult leader. He believed that Armageddon was coming and we were to be uh, an army for God uh, and his children. Um, Jessica will mention something here in a little bit that will blow you away of what why these girls were there. But, you know, cults begin with a charismatic leader uh, who claim they have some supreme knowledge. Uh, and this is what Fountain did. Uh, believe me, because I was put in a place where tapes were played over and over and over and over again in the Maoist doctrine of how you brainwash an individual. The second thing is a, a group suppresses skepticism. Um you know, any type of skepticism, anything that you would say. And of course, you, you couldn't say anything. So this wouldn't come up a, as much. But with some of the people that had been in there a little bit later, let's say would get a little rebellious and say something, this was immediately taken care of um, with the screaming in your face of fire and brimstone going to hell and this and that for having any type of critical thinking. You could not have any critical thinking. Um, what happens is the group delegitimizes former members as well. So let's say you were somebody that had gotten out and something had happened. They would talk about them as being demons and, and uh, not of God. And they were more than likely probably dead anyways and taken away by God. Um, that's how they got away with that. Um, you know, so that you would not be obviously encouraged to try to get out of there. Is that what one time earlier it did not have a fence when when I had to leave it it was fenced very high um, with some very not barbed wire but it had the spokes that stuck up I believe and I remember them very well because I got caught into, into them uh, which was not very fun the fourth is the group is paranoid about the outside world I mean this is one of the biggest things that did occur here that's what everything was you didn't know anything about the outside world people nothing um we're gonna end up reading an article to you later about people that got out that didn't even know who the president was that the vietnam war was over um nothing 
they had no knowledge because they had been brainwashed so highly. Uh, and again, given the privilege of being trusted, which is really just a mirroring effect, it's, it's a projection to make them feel special so that they could put them in control over other kids, over other youths, and made them, again, to feel special. Uh, their group relies on shame cycles. Um, in fact, actually, let, let me stop on that one right there. Jessica, I bet you, what were a few of the things like as being from the, the, the girl's side of it, like they would say or you would hear said to the right. girls there talking about shame? And I think that's the difference between that we were discussing before the way the girls and the boys were treated, because we were basically um, being groomed and brainwashed to be wives and mothers um, and part of this wonderful family that they were creating. Um, and, and yeah, for the end of the world. Yeah. And, yeah. And all their, all their doctrine and all the, all the Bible verses that we were taught and we had to memorize and everything was, was pounded into our head went all along that, that same uh, tone, if you will, of, of being wives and mothers and being obedient down, even down to the way we had to dress. I mean, that was the first thing that happened when I got there, I was stripped naked and was uh, given a long skirt and, uh, top to put on that was long sleeves and all the way up to my neck so I wasn't showing any part of my body. We weren't allowed to cut our hair. Of course, there was no makeup. Uh, we had to look like women and not men, you know, that type of thing. So I, it was it was really different the way the girls and the boys were treated. Yeah, yeah. And I'm talking about like, you know, the, the words that Fountain or some of the other people that were in charge would call you guys, you know, you're a slut. You're this, you know, we they were would whores. you down, whores. Right. And I want to ask anybody out there right now that we've gotten just to this point and we haven't even scratched the surface, take what Jessica just said and then try to legitimize that, that, oh, no, this is just, this is just a hardcore military academy. Does that happen at military schools? This, this, this is not a military school, people. This is not a military school in any shape, form or matter other than it looking from the outside the parent rolls up of what the barracks look like and you know they would pull the kids out and kind of line them up and of course their heads are shaved down so that's what it's going to look like all right so here's the here's a big one right here you know number six is the leader is above the law and you're going to be hearing about that so much through this series of what happened after the main raid because there was a mini one that had occurred before 1988, but that was the big one. That was supposed to be the one that was going to take care of this forever and to never occur again. But of course, we're going to explain to you that it didn't, and it just kind of popped up um, around. So a prevailing idea among cult leaders is that they are above the law, be it human or divine. This idea allows them to exploit their followers economically. Wow. Hear that? What were we just talking about? And sexually without repercussions. Okay? We didn't write this. I didn't write this article. And, and it just explains it right there. That's exactly what occurred. Why uh, this place was specifically chosen for me um, because of my my family. And they figured if they would, would break me later, they would have access to to these funds over and over again. I don't know. Maybe they would do it where they felt like the parents would say they owed them. I don't know. Um, and then the sexual side of it um, that we, we just talked about. So when confronted, they never confess. Jessica just read something to me. We're not going to talk about it today, but it blew my mind. What I just saw today with this man, a picture, and with somebody else, I'm not sure who it is, but what he said, and we're going to save that towards the end because it's going to make most of you either become so queasy you're going to want to throw up or you're going to cry. I don't know what you're going to do. Um, and especially after hearing about the abuses of what happened to specific individuals to the degree that they happened, this isn't just about 
getting spanked <laughs> or switched, you know, which he did. You got, you got, you got switched there with very, very big switches, but you know, and this was across your back legs, buttocks, body. This wasn't just across your butt for getting into trouble. I mean, you know, my father gave me a, a belt when I was a kid, but I didn't look at that as being something horrible. I didn't hate my father because he did that. I did something bad at school and he gave me a belt. <laughs> it was no big deal. This was completely different. All right. So the group uses thought reform methods. Uh, serious questions are answered with cliches. Um, you know, if that's happening, you're, you're probably in a cult. Indoctrination or brainwashing is the process through which the cult slowly breaks down a person's sense of identity. It's called the uh, breaking your pride and building your character for those of you that were there and understand and ability to think rationally. So I'm going to read that again. And this is why you have so many people online that are picking on people, the ones, the thousands that are saying this occurred to me. I was beaten within inches of my life or I was raped or I, again, I'm not going to go any, any further right now. Okay. You get the idea. Indoctrination or brainwashing is the process through which a cult slowly breaks down a person's sense of identity and ability to think rationally. And unfortunately, this is what's happened to a lot of people now that they are older. They're not able to identify what happened to them when they were younger. And uh, the cult-like atmosphere and the horrors that were going on to other people. And to actually come out and say things like that didn't happen with, that, with having no knowledge with having no proof, nothing. Okay. And I'm not saying that the person that's making the statement that just by doing it, they're proving anything. It doesn't matter. But if I see that thousands of times, literally the same things over and over again, that means statistically it is very high that it occurred. And if you're dealing with a cult, you're not going to get a lot of information that you can corroborate down to like an affidavit. That's why it's a cult. <laughs> Right? I mean, this is common sense that I think anybody and everybody that's listening out there is going to understand. Um, and in fact, even wonder why would these people say things like that online to people that are in their 50s and can't even leave their own homes? They have their anxiety is so horrible. Or again, like I said, many people I've known that committed suicide or became heroin addicts or they came out. 10, 10 times worse than when they went in, just like regular prisons, you know, where that occurs. And in fact, here, to some degree, we even had less rights than federal prisons have and prisoners have, um, though I definitely would never, ever want to be in a federal prison, that's for sure. Um, that's a much different situation. But I'm just saying about your rights and being handed over to, um, as guardianship is a little different. So the hallmark of indoctrination is the use of thought terminating cliches, platitudes like follow the leader or doubt your doubts are regurgitated over and over so that members don't have to critically analyze complex issues. I have a number of these I need to find. And on the next episode, you're going to hear them that are taken directly from the military. Um, and I know a lot of people listening right now are going to know exactly what I'm talking about, about chants, uh, songs, um, um, obviously Bible verses, but specific chants uh, that we would do about blood and killing and killing, about killing people. And then maybe you wonder why later we had school shootings. And again, I, I can't prove we're putting that together, but it just makes you think a little bit. Um because it's very similar to that type of thinking and indoctrination that these kids did not get help in their schools. They did not have access to counseling and maybe were bullied. Um, again, like the poor Columbine and what happened in these poor people, the anniversary. But, you know, a lot of that is built into this, folks. So that's the problem and why we decided to do this and need to do it because parents need to recognize what's being done, how it's being done, and what to not do. Because 90% of what you see out there, online or anywhere else, is 
a uh, ring of some type, as high as a pedophilia ring, down to just being a massively um, horrific physical abuse. Um, I don't even know what to call it. There's, I don't have a name for a school academy. That's the name they put on it, but that's not what they are. Okay. Cults see themselves as enlightened or chosen exactly how Herman Fountain thought he was an elect organization tasked with radically transforming individual lives and the entire world. When you listen to Herman Fountain and when you hear him speak, And you look at this man's eyes and the evil that is behind this person's eyes. And when you hear his voice and the way he speaks, everything is about the rest of the world. Nothing is about him. Nothing. It's about the whores and the boys that are drug addicts and killers. We were there with people that were murderers and had killed people. I know that's hard for people to understand, but in the state of Mississippi, they were able to do that. I don't know how. I don't, but it was allowed. People were court ordered there for many reasons, armed robbery, but yes, murder. And here I am, a kid that's just smoking a little pot. <laughs> and you got to get a little pregnant. And I, I, this is who I'm in with. And, and Jessica as, as well. Um, the, the, the elitism creates greater sense of group unity and responsibility, which is centered on a united purpose, which again, to the fountains, which I can speak for, I can't speak specifically for some of the other people that were in control. I'm going to leave that to some others to discuss, but um, it was his responsibility to manipulate as being a cult leader and to coerce members into Quote, risky financial behavior, sexual favors, free manual labors. <laughs> we were free manual labor for the entire uh, town and county of Lucidale, taken out on chain gangs to work on the railroad and, and on uh, buildings and many other things that I've read about. Um, I was only there about four months, so I can't speak for every place, but I, I worked at some of these places and actually almost got onto one of the trains as it was going by because it was obviously my goal from the first moment I got there to get out of this hellhole knowing what it was. Number nine, no financial transparency. Okay, so that goes into what we just spoke about, that there was no tuition and things of this nature so that they could hide the money. They uh, took in money many different ways, but a big part was in targeting families that were wealthy and to give them quite a bit of money. Let's say, you know, a hundred thousand dollars is going to go a long way, a long way in Lucidale, Mississippi, um, or 20 grand is going to go a long way. 50 grand. It's, it's going to go a long way. Uh, and last but not least, the group performs secret rights, which I know was occurring again with the trusted individuals that were compartmentalized and given specific tasks and roles. Um, in order to have complete and utter control over what was going on there. Um, Jennifer, what, um, do you have anything to, to say on that? And if not, I'm going to read um, that, <clears throat> that, that quick um, page and that letter that was written in that I think is really going to hit home for people. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I'm just saying, do you have anything that, if not, it's no problem, because I'll go right in no, and, and, no, and read no. it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I can do that, because I have a feeling after I read that anyways, that you 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 would probably have something to say about it anyways. So let me just um, find that real quick. Okay. So this, this is an article from back, <clears throat> excuse me, in 88. It's called Daddy's Place. Is it a home or a hell on earth? Sometimes they call him daddy, Rebecca Stringer did. She called him that even after he shoved her up against a wall, caned her with a switch, called her a morphodite, and mocked her speech impediment. Beautiful man, right? Beautiful, beautiful human being. She called him daddy even after he pitted her in boxing matches with other girls 
after he locked her in the cooler, which you're going to hear about later, it was called something else to me, slapped her, spit in her face, and told her what a worthless piece of human flotsam she was. This is what I was alluding to with uh, with Jessica. This is what was occurring to her and other girls. This is how they were being spoken to at the time, these, these young girls. The fact was he was the closest thing to a daddy Rebecca had ever known. And even today, eight years since she stopped calling him that, she still dreams about him. That's called brainwashing. In the meantime, Pastor Herman Fountain, ordained Baptist minister, former protege of the late Texas fundamentalist Lester Roloff, an overlord of the Bethel Children's Home, has gained prominence in this rustic little community. After Rebecca Stringer and 35 other children were forcibly removed from him by the state of Mississippi in 1980, so that's the earlier uh, point I was mentioning to everybody, he more than tripled the occupancy of the home. He created his own con- construction company manned by the unpaid teenage boys in his care. He's built dormitories, an office building, and a new church on the 28-acre former KOA campground that houses, quote, unquote, his ministry. And when the state stepped in again this August and took 72 other youngsters from the home, and the tales of physical brutality and emotional abuse began to pour out in court, he put the bucolic little town of Lucidale on the map, even if it's not in any way the residents appreciate. Of course they didn't appreciate that. (laughs) In fact, few in Lucidale knew the preacher, Fountain, 38, who was a man who, by his own account, was a real heroin addict in New York City at the age of 19. Somehow, he said, he woke up in a hospital with hepatitis, found God, went to Bible college in Florida and started his own church in Oklahoma City. That church failed. And I'd heard that Brother Roloff might need some help down in Corpus Christi. So I headed down there to work with them, he said. Fountain worked with Roloff's Rebecca home for a little more than a year before leaving in 1978 with Rebecca Stringer and her brother and sister handed over to him by Roloff as a start for his ministry in Mississippi. Mississippi was no random choice by Fountain. It's one of the four states in which church homes that do not receive state or federal funds can go unlicensed and unsupervised and one in which Fountain can exercise his belief of separation of church and state. Did you guys pay attention to that and understand everything that we're talking about here? You need to put slowly start putting the pieces of the puzzle together and how and why anything like this could possibly even occur. This man was smart. He knew what he was doing. This man was sick. They the state and federal officials have all their different authorities they have to answer to, he said. Here at Bethel, we only have one, and that's God. Okay, hear that? As long as I don't take their money, they don't have no business in here. If I've done something criminal to these kids, I ought to be in jail, and they've got laws to cover that. Well, we're going to explain that later, too, why he wasn't there. What a liar this man is, and didn't take money. My God. All right. Again, guys, this is very personal, and it's it's a little, little crazy. Um, what Fountain has done is a matter of opinion, obviously, in a subject the George County Grand Jury is considering this week. By his own description, he has run a tightly disciplined facility in which violent, rebellious youngsters were taught to say, yes, sir, and little else. By others, he's been a tyrant who created a Dickinson torture chamber where young children were beaten, brainwashed, and deprived. Whatever the case, any firsthand knowledge of it is relegated to Fountain and his staff and the children who've passed through the home because they were so afraid, people, so afraid. 
Because Bethel is unlicensed, the state of Mississippi has no record of how many children have been there, who they are, where they came from, or what happened to them while they were there, and little authority to investigate. That's another sentence you need to pay attention to. Nobody knows how many people. Nobody knows where they came from. And the most important at all, nobody knows where they went. You understand this? Okay. And this, this is specific information and quotes coming from the state here. Okay. Had the children been questioned earlier, they would have been given accounts of the black room, an unlighted storage closet in which children were locked for disobedience, the cooler, a bare room with an uncovered light bulb in which children were held for weeks at a time and forced to listen to the continuous droning of sermons by Roloff. Now, I'm going to say, this occurred to me. It was not called the cooler. It was called something else. And it was done by Brother Fountain once it became Bethel. My occurrence was horrific, and I will, I will go into details about that and how I was able to get through it. Um, I, and it was completely different. Anyway, so Pops, the floggings administered by Fountain and his staff, leaving welts and open wounds on the legs and buttocks. I'm not going to say this word. It's the only one I will not say. I will swear. But the N-word piles, Bethel's term for the practice of having a group of boys, boys pile on one another and pummel them. And there were tales of regimentation that reached the point of severity. When a child entered Bethel, for which his parents usually paid an entry fee of $750 and a monthly charge of $250, but wait a minute, I thought he didn't take any money. His head was shaved and he was put on watch with another trusted youngster, brainwashed youngster, (laughs) assigned to observe him minute by minute, day and night, 24-7. The newcomer was not allowed to speak to anyone else. You had no privacy at all. There was no contact with home or the outside world. No calls to parents for the first two months. Uh, And that's a bull because mine went on for four. No visits for six months. Incoming mail was open and outgoing mail was censored. All phone calls were monitored. All money from parents was taken and kept by the home. There were no newspapers, magazines, movies, radios, or televisions. Is this a cult or is this a military academy? Just want to keep drilling this home. And it's going to keep drilling it home to you guys. Because again, we've only begun to explain what occurred here. There were no trips to town. At night, trusted youngsters were posted on guard at the doors to keep others from escaping. Any discussion of leaving brought swift, sure punishment. And you guys will get the story of your life on how I was able to actually get out of this place. There was uh, rationing of toilet paper, seven squares per day, and rationing of time in the shower, one and a half minutes in the shower. Imagine seven squares. This is true. Seven squares of toilet paper, and you're eating food that literally would have maggots in it sometimes. Jessica can tell you that because the girls made the food. Correct, Jessica? Right. We cooked it. We were we were there to cook <laughs> for the boys, and that's what we did. Yeah. And it's not their fault. They didn't put it in there, but they, they she can just corroborate that. This was the most disgusting food on the planet, uh, and, it, and it did. I don't it, even know. I couldn't even describe maggots. it. Yeah, I don't even know yeah. what it was. It was just slop. It was it was worse than what Not I food. would classify as as yeah. army food. You know, I mean, it's just yeah, it was horrible. And I will tell people this one thing to prep them. I'm gonna just gonna say one. You get there, you eat this stuff again, which isn't food. You're obviously your your body isn't used to it. You, you're gonna vomit. You're gonna throw up. Okay, you know what? You better eat it. They made you eat it. You're vomit. Walk around the table. And by the time they got around the table, if you had not eaten all of your vomit, you were beaten severely and they would start again. They would make you throw up, force you to, fingers down the throat, whatever, till you threw up and then you ate it again. Again, I'm only scratching the surface. I know that's disgusting. Uh, I hate to, but you guys all need to understand 
what was going on there before we even get into the physical. And this, that was nothing actually. I mean, that, that was, you know, <sighs> okay. And you know what the other no, thing we have to remember yeah. is, yeah. is people are being told that they're sending their children there because it's a school. There was no school. I don't, I don't know how it was for you, but I know for the girls, there was yeah. absolutely no school. There, there was a little bit, but it wasn't a real school. And I think they put it on for show because I remember people coming in and out. And maybe it was like if a parent was there but demanded to see something, that's where they would take them to make it pretend like they were really doing school. Because they're, it, they're, well, I remember opening a book, but I mean, this happened like once. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. We had a class. So they had something. Um, that we went and read the Bible and, and we did workbooks, um, but no accreditation. No. I remember a little math, but yeah, Bible, mostly yeah. Bible related, yeah. obviously everything. Yeah. Having to memorize the, uh, you know, the verses every, every day. And if you didn't memorize it, you know, and depending on a person's level of ability to memorize um, a lot of these children, again, you just keep being beaten over and over until you get it. Um, and some of them just never get it. We were forced to do uh, laps. Doing push-ups, laps. Yeah, 500 at a time when I got there. That's what I got woken up to on New Year's Eve is to wake up to doing 500 push-ups. Thank God I was in very good shape. Uh, um, I made it through many, many, many did not and were beaten so badly. And that was actually one of the first times I saw how badly people were, were beaten and some closed fist beating going on. Um, and that's when I knew that I was just going to be smarter than everybody else there, kind of do what I was told, get information out to the other kids that I was going to get out of there and then just try to get them out. But yeah, yeah, it's all right. Let me get this. Let's finish this. So, you know, there were work gangs divided into distinct groups. Uh, the first assigned to the least desirable tasks, again, was called the N-word crew. The second, known as the workers, dismantled condemned buildings, cleaned lots and gardens, and did roofing jobs. There was the lack, here we go, there was the lack of education. Bethel relies on the accelerated Christian education program, whatever that is, which requires a child to learn on his own without teachers and is not accredited. Finally, there was religion, rigid, intractable, fundamentalist dogma spotted, spouted by Fountain and his staff. This is fire and brimstone spitting in your face about going to hell that, you know, and again, talking down to us like that we were pieces of shit. You know, they knew they knew what your hot buttons were because they had your file. They knew they whatever it is that they were going to say. And to me, they were, you know, daddy's boy and rich boy, you don't do anything and this and that. And that, that's how they would get to you. But, you know, I didn't let, I didn't let it get to me. Um, but yeah, this was their form of, uh, of teaching. It's a very, um, you know, every child was a frightful sinner is what it says here. Condemned to hell with only one narrow avenue of escape to follow Fountain's every dictate. And that's true. Unfortunately, for most of everybody there, that's all they could do. Catholics were idolatrous heretics. The Pope, the Antichrist. Jews were despicable. Blacks bore the mark of Cain. And Fountain doesn't deny it. About 80% of everything that's been said about me is true, he said. I don't have a bunch of good little kids in here. I've got some terrible kids. I've got transvestites, homosexuals, nymphomaniacs, punks. I had a kid who raped his sister and murdered her. When a girl acts like a slut and a whore, I call her a slut and a whore. If a boy acts like a queer, I call him a queer. If somebody in our group needs churching, we church them. That's it. Now, you know, I'd like to point out that again, to the people online that talk about nothing going on there, about how this helped them. I'm so happy that terminology or being treated in that manner helped you in any way. I, I, I would feel, and actually, I'm going to be bold enough to say I know that it didn't really help you. All right, so... Um, 
He said that we're saving their souls. On May 8th, one of the souls slipped out of Bethel. A 15-year-old boy broke out and fled as many before. But this boy, later to be known as SDL in court testimony, proved to be different. SDL, who had hidden in a locker until evening church services began, slipped quietly out of his dormitory and tore out of Bethel on a bicycle. He made it to a convenience store and called the George County Sheriff's Office, who dispatched, called child welfare investigator Kathy Prine. And Prine began questioning SDL. He had come to Bethel in 86 at age 13 and had a longer history there than most runaways. He'd been on the bottom of the N-word piles and gotten more than his share of beatings, been locked in the cooler and verbally humiliated in front of his peers. But that was not what made SDL different. There were other stories equally as shocking from Bethel. What set him apart was that he had nowhere to go. No one wanted him and he was willing to testify. So that is my connection here. When he was willing to testify, he had nowhere to go. The other boy that went out with me had a family and my father came and picked me up. So therefore, my testimony was given to the Lucidale Police Department on site. Then it was provided by phone to the FBI later. And then it was provided to the commission, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, congressional committee in order because they have to authorize these types of things. So this is where this SDL would have also come into play. And thank God he did, because then he would have been corroborating what I'm saying and myself. So the right and the left hand there and not even knowing each other or what's going on. So thank God for that. Um, And so his story could be proved. Uh, George County Prosecutor Mark Maples found boys who had left Bethel before SDL and some who later who corroborated his tale. They told of how SDL had been pelted with clods in a ditch, how he'd been caned and cursed, and how he had been refused his own glasses for failing eyesight. I mean, come on, you can't see? Um A hearing was called to determine if SDL, and again, here's more corroborating evidence for, again, the people online. I'm telling you, leave these people alone. Stop telling them that this didn't occur to them. You can say whatever you want. We have freedom of speech in this country, and I believe that. You do have a right, and I believe you. I believe that nothing happened to you. But don't tell other people that something didn't happen to them. A hearing was called to determine if SDL qualified as an abused child and could be taken as a ward of the state. And on June 1st, he took the stand. He told of the beatings and abuse. He told how he was a bedwetter and was placed on all night pee watch, awakened hourly and forced to urinate and was punished if he couldn't and beaten if he wet the bed. Yeah, this sounds like a school to me. Other children followed on the witness stand. Doctors testified that many of the girls had no menstrual periods. Hmm. Interesting, huh? A direct result of emotional stress. I'm sure it went further than that as well. The girls themselves told of verbal and physical abuse by Fountain and staff member brother David Owens. And I'm going to tell you something at at a later point that Owens did to me that is just going to seriously need some major disclaimers because it could set some people off and we don't want to, we, we just don't want to do that. Um, we're here to help people heal. Okay. Set the record straight. They told how they were forced to bend over and raise their dresses to receive licks and how Owens forced them to do the chair, bending the knees and assuming a sitting position against the wall for long periods. A lot of us know what that is or stand on tiptoe with their chins against the wall. In Mississippi, we have laws protecting animals from mistreatment, Maple said. We don't have enough protecting kids. On May 8th, Fountain was called to testify. A few times he took the Fifth Amendment. Yeah, I wonder why. But more often, he flatly refused, stating that he believed he was answerable to no one but God. Cult. You guys are going to have to add up. Just, Just keep it going and keep adding up all of the factual information explaining why and how this is a cult in every extensive purpose from James Jones to Waco 
style. This is all very, very similar. Judge Robert Oswald found Fountain, Owens and brother, Tom McDonald in contempt and leveled daily fines of $500 each. He ordered all the children removed from the home and State Welfare Commissioner Tom Britton Jr. made arrangements for them to be housed in unused in, a, in I'm sorry, in an unused portion of a state mental institution. That gave Fountain an edge. He returned to Bethel, where he gathered the children in the church and told them, you've got to, or you're going to a nut house. I have no more control over you. That prompted some children to flee. But do you see what he's really doing here, people, and why you don't understand? He's not warning you to help you. He wants you out of there because he knows that you are full of testimony. You are full of bruises. You are full of being beaten or or raped. Or, uh, again, I think anybody in their right mind uh, understands that. So, again, he prompted them to do this, and they all ran. State troopers and sheriff's deputies spent hours picking up others found wandering along the streets or hiding in private homes. Some were found hiding in trees. Interesting hiding in private homes. I bet you some of the people in town actually let them do it. Because they did know by that point a lot of what was going on. So that's that's possible. And if they did, phew, good for them. Uh, and today the case is at a standstill. Britain, Maples, and others hope it's publicly will come to help the push for regulatory legislation of the 72 children, all but two have been placed in foster homes. State institutions are returned to their families. One of those, too, is SDL. Oddly enough, these terrible kids appeared to be pretty normal youngsters who'd simply been deprived of any sort of education, Britain said. We didn't have any trouble with them. Actually, I had said that earlier. That's interesting. Something very similar to that. And Fountain continues to operate Bethel. About 40 youths, about 20 of those younger than 18, are housed there. The fines against Fountain, Owens, and McDonald's have reached $150,000. He has been sued by two former students, Rhonda Traxler, who says he sexually molested her, absolutely, and Ray Ferrari, Ferrari, who's suing for involuntary servitude, but Fountain says he's not worried. Of course he's not worried. He's in Mississippi. Those fines will never be paid, he said. They can take this place if they want to. It's mortgaged up to the hilt anyway. So maybe they'll pay it off and save my good name. Anyhow, I came here without anything and I can leave that way and start over if I have to and just leave outside Lucidale. Or I'm sorry, and just outside Lucidale, Rebecca Stringer lives in a normal home with the husband and child and has an almost normal life. Sometimes I dream about it, dream that I'm still there, and I wake up scared, she said. When I got out, I didn't know who won the war in Vietnam. I had to find out who the president was. I couldn't read very well. I guess I really didn't know what TV was either. She didn't know what TV was. I want to cry right now. I'd see the shows, and I thought they were real. My father-in-law had to explain to me that they were just actors in stories. The fact is, I had to go back to school to get my high school diploma. Fountain stole all of those years out of my life, and I'll never forgive him for that. And before I left, I had a Bible, and a lot of the other kids signed it, and Fountain signed it too. He wrote, Are you going to school, Rebecca? But he wrote it like I talk, like the cool, T-H-C-O-O-L, instead of school. And Webecca, W-E-B-E-C-C-A. See what he's doing? He's making fun of her speech impediment. I'm starting to wonder about the people that are listening to this, think should happen to this person. wanted to give that a moment of thought. I erased what he wrote, but I can't erase his memory. So let's digest that for a minute. Um, what do you think, Jessica? I mean, could you imagine being somewhere 
And again, this, this is why I read this. And there's so many, there's hundreds of stories like this and hundreds of written documents from people explaining this in detail. This isn't, these aren't things you can make up. Oh, okay? no, not at all. And- right. It's too much detail and we can all corroborate it. We know it. Um, I actually knew Rebecca when I was there. She was yeah, one of the that. main main girls that would come and pray with us. Um, and and actually hearing and actually have read what you what you just read um, right. a few times in the past. And the first time I read it, it actually shocked me because. And before I understood, you know, about all the the cult mentality and the brainwashing, but she was Mm -hmm. one of the main girls that was pushing his doctrine and pushing his way of life and trying to get us. It's all she knew. Yeah, um, obviously, obviously. um, And I'm I'm glad now in a way, I hate that she went through it, but I'm kind of glad now to see that she realizes um, that it wasn't right. Um, and that she she was yeah. brainwashed, and hopefully um, she's on her way to to healing the, right. the way we are. Yeah, it's a shame because how bad it could have been if she didn't. I mean, again, that's how these places just keep popping up. And again, folks, we're going to get into that because I'm telling you, you have no idea what's still going on out there. And it's again not really to this level because again, we're going to be taking it up notches. Um, of concepts and ideas and specific things that occurred to us personally, uh, but also other people that were there and uh, the truth, you know, what's, uh, what's really there. So, and, and so what I'm going to do to get this started too, is I'm going to read through this really quick as well about cults since it is the beginning and just kind of a, a definition a little bit, because we need to do that each time. So in case anybody misses any other episodes, if they're a parent, you know, they know what to look for and and um, what's really going on. Because especially for the people that do get brainwashed, again, it's why they're brainwashed. They have no idea what's going on to them or that anything is wrong. They think this is how the world works or how everything is going on. They would have no idea. This is like MK MKUltra, um, which the government did, um, you know, using people you know, fighting what they thought the uh, Soviet Union was doing at the same time back in the uh, 50s and 60s and using LSD and and other things to to try to uh, control people. So a lot of the same doctrines uh, were used. But really the main one uh, for Bethel was the Maoist doctrine of the culture uh, revolution that occurred in China and what that man did. Um, It's very, very sneaky in how he did it. So anyways, let me just say, let's get real quick here. So a cult is a group or a movement that to a significant degree exhibits great or excessive devotion or dedication to some person, idea, or thing. They use thought reform program to persuade, control, and socialize members, for example, to integrate them into the group's unique pattern of relationships, beliefs, values, and practices. Systematically, it induces states of psychological dependency in members. It exploits members to advance the leadership's end goal and causes psychological harm to members or families in the community. So just in those statements alone, it, in that nutshell, it explains completely, again, why some people have certain circumstances and know certain things happen to them and others have no idea at all and think nothing happened. So that's how this works. That's how it's, uh, and made to be effective because if everybody knew, then it wouldn't be, um, a cult that would work with children. It's a little bit different. Like, like a Jim Jones things built up and built up and built up and built up until it became as big as it was and cult like, um, that's a whole other story we don't need to get into, but everybody understands what I'm saying. It's just, it's similar. So, you know, they're the final and sole authority rule maker and rule enforcer over the group. It's always almost the founder, as we talked about early, earlier, is extremely charismatic and convincing. And I'm telling you, Brother Fountain was, he was actually, the way the man spoke and the way he did things was Hitler-like. 
in his fire and brimstone preaching and the guys that he chose were all chosen for a reason. They're charismatic and convincing. Claims that he or she has found the best way to God or to nirvana or whatever, inner peace, like when, you know, and other types of, of cults. So with him, obviously, it was with, with God, um, that he almost felt as if he was God. They don't suffer or sacrifice as the followers do. They're always above scrutiny or criticism. Nothing's ever their fault. They can make their own followers do practically anything. And I see it to this day again in these videos, in these comments, in these people. He's still, still subconsciously in their brain, causing them to say and make statements that are not true. That's how much power that man and these systems have on individuals. So they're based on the conviction that it is for the greater good, which you'll hear later too. He really believes this. It's for the greater good. If Christians reject the standard Bible study methods and instead uses faulty interpretation, misuses passages, or even rewrites his or her own version, they have traits defined by psychologists as narcissistic personality disorder. That is Herman Fountain. That's it to a T, narcissistic personality disorder. Disorder. So then you get an information control, deliberately holding back information, distorting information to make it accessible, outright lying, access to non cult sources of information, which you have none of, books, articles, newspapers, magazines, TV, radio, critical information, uh, former members. Uh, they keep members so busy they don't have time to think. We got up at four, we are out there chipping bricks in a field all day long, digging holes, filling them back up again. This is all you were doing. So that's what that means. Keep the members busy so they don't have time to think. Fortunately, I had time to think. I understood what was going on to me and knew it wasn't going to happen for much longer. Anyways, information is not freely accessible, of course. Spying on other members is encouraged. That was everywhere here. Pairing, and listen, pairing up with buddy system to monitor and control. Here it is in the, the website specifically to define through our government of what cults are. What did I tell you occurs when you first get in there? You get paired with somebody to monitor and control you. I am destroying every one of you out there who are belittling these people. And I'm going to keep telling you that, you know, just to get it through your head. And maybe you all apologize to some of these people at some point, or the people that need it just become healed. And we all get through this. Because we are all going to be okay. It is going to be okay. We can't go back and change this. And you can't let people like that affect you. You just can't. And I've seen people get really angry on there about it. But you got to let it go. You just got to. They're just. We live in an online world now of anonymity. And <laughs> did I say it right? Anonymity. Um, you know, that they're not going to say it directly to your face. Trust me. So... Newspapers, magazine, journals, audio tapes, and videotapes are all used uh, with propaganda. Misquotations, statements taken out of context uh, from non-cult-like sources, unethical use of confession, information about sins used to abolish identity boundaries, past sins used to manipulate and control, no forgiveness or absolution. Jessica, this is, I really think of you here. And the girls, uh, that would have been used to a T about, quote, the past sins, calling you sluts and whores and this and that. And it's just horrific. This actually sounds like Thought a handbook can, right? that they followed verbatim. <laughs> I mean, oh, yeah. No, it, that's what I mean. It is. Uh, I And like I said, I had even seen um, a copy. There's a, what's called, again, the, the Maoist Doctrine on a table. And I can't remember his name because it wasn't Owen's. That's why I wish Mike was able to join us today, but it was the other guy that was in charge of the Rose Garden on his desk. He had a book, and it was about the uh, Chinese Revolution. It, so that's where 
this does come from. It is like a, like a handbook. Wow. Um, that's what they talk about. So, but yeah, even what we're reading here, it, it, it is, it's a, like a handbook. Yeah. It's, I have, <laughs> so I actually, if you wanted to go out and do it, it's right here. I literally have the chills as you're reading this. Cause it's so it's, I, it's just verbatim. Yeah. It's verbatim. Yep. All right. We're almost done folks. So, but obviously the most important is thought control. So, you know, you need to internalize the group's doctrine as truth. And that's why you're not allowed to talk to anybody. That's why you're watched. That's why you have to learn their specific Bible verses. And that's it. Because that's all they want you thinking about. That's it. Um, map equals reality. Black and white thinking. Good versus evil. Us versus them. Emotional control. Manipulate and narrow the range of a person's feelings. Make the person feel like as if they are ever any problems it is always their fault it is never the leader of the group's fault excessive use of guilt identity guilt who you are not living up to your potential your family past affiliations thoughts feelings and actions social guilt historical guilt uses of fear these this this was used on me um with in a horrible situation i'll explain later fear of thinking independently fear of the outside world fear of enemies, fear of losing one's salvation, fear of leaving the group or being shunned by the group, fear of disapproval. I'll just say this one thing. When my father came to pick me up, I was there in the police station and it actually was Owens. He brought a trash bag with just my few things. And and as he's, well, he knew I outsmarted them for three weeks, they were hunting us down. And I'm, I'm absolutely sure they would have killed us, but whatever. Uh, he walks out. And whispers in my ear, we're going to come and get you and we're going to kill you. Wow. I want that to sink into people. Yeah. So they understand the psychological side. And that's exactly what this is. the excessive use of fear of leaving the group and being shunned and, you know, fear of the enemies of the outside world and of them. Um, that was the last thing I heard. And why to this day I have chronic insomnia people know this about me they know it's true I, i've been up many times for eight days straight before and on many occasions just i uh, can't sleep and it's not even that i'm dwelling on these things it's just so ingrained it's just so deep inside because of what we saw and what we dealt with i my memory is like i said for the past is, is very photographic i remember smells sights and sounds but, but names, <laughs> you know, my, my Achilles heel and my short-term uh, memory. And again, probably from smoking all that pot and being such a bad kid, you know. So, um, <laughs> so the extremes of emotional highs and lows, ritual and often public confessions of sins, that happened a lot where they'd make you get up in front of the group or they were going to switch you and say what you did. Phobia uh, of indoctrination. No happiness or fulfillment outside of the group. That was definitely drilled into you. There, there's no happiness or fulfillment outside of that place. Terrible consequences will take place if you ever leave. Hear what I just said? Hell, demon possession, incurable diseases, accidents, suicide, which happened to many of people that I know. Insanity. 10,000 reincarnations at the fire and brimstone. But right in there, you could hear exactly what I just said and what makes it that much more real. Shunning of uh, uh, being rejected by friends, peers, and family. Never a legitimate reason to leave from the group's perspective. People who leave are weak. They're undisciplined. I guarantee you after I left, that's what they all said about me so that no one would leave. Yeah. They're unspiritual and worldly. I remember that. <laughs> Definitely worldly. I, I hated that word. Brainwashed by family counselors. Seduced by money. Like Jessica and I talked about earlier. Um, or that's what they, that's not what they mean here. They're talking about seduced by money, sex, rock, and roll. Um, the recruiting and fundraising practices of occults are aggressive, deceptive, and unethical. And that's where I'm going to stop at this point about anything having really to do with Bethel. Because again, we have to unpack this now, not right this minute, but anybody that's out there listening that uh, was in Bethel um, 
from when it opened or was created by Herman up through the raid, we'd like to hear from you at Pull Up a Pew Podcast, P-U-L-L-U-P-A-P-E-W P-O-D-C-A-S-T at Gmail. It's going to be said in the closing um, many times and repeated, uh, so you'll hear it. Just email us. Please, short though. I want to hear your story. We want to hear about it. Um, and the ones that can corroborate what we're talking about and everything, we'd love to have you on because we're definitely have to. There's no way around this. We've got to do two or three of these because there's so much going on here. Um, and we also want to make sure that everybody is uh, kept safe out there. And, um, you know, if you're feeling depressed at a gentleman that was going to be on, and I know he's very timid even to this day, I'm telling you, it sticks with you. And again, with with people committing suicide, if you ever feel that way or you're feeling depressed or you've got thoughts of suicide, you got to call the National Center for Suicide Prevention, which is one 800 273-8255. Again, 800-273-8255. And then uh, another national hotline, 866-615-6464. Again, 866-615-6464. And I'm going to give you one other one. It's called Boys Town, but it's not really about Boys Town. What's interesting about it is this is specifically created for children and families. And that's what I like about it. Their number is 800-448-3000. Again, 800-448-3000. Do not send your kids anywhere. Call these hotlines. Talk to them. Send us an email. Talk to, do your due diligence online. Go to the place minimally, even though that's not really going to help because they're only going to show you what they want to show you. And um, like we said, these places are still occurring, but they're occurring through the healthcare system, believe it or not. It's not like it was at Bethel. And, and thank God they don't have that kind of control now of literally, you know, having guardianship. Um, but I do know for a fact that there are uh, kids that, again, are in what are called WASP programs, W-A-S-P, and they are heavily regimented. They do get beaten. Uh, they get talked down to. And again, a lot of it's similar. It's just different. It's just, it is different. Um, there's an incredible uh, gentleman that's about 10 years younger than us that went to Bethel because it had reopened out of their, another name, um, Alan Knott. And he uh, wrote a book of uh, uh, Surviving Bethel. Right, Jessica? Surviving Bethel. Alan Knoll. Yep. And uh, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Alan Knoll. Knoll. Did I say William? If I said William, I apologize. Yeah, Alan Knoll. But, uh, so he, and he is a current, just so that you guys know, was from a later time period. So it's not going to cover what we just went over, but we still highly recommend that you read it because it's still very similar. And it's going to apply more for parents and for children today and tactics that may be being used because it's a little bit closer to our t- for, to this time period than the 1980s, of course, and, and the cult-like atmosphere um, and why... Bethel was operating as opposed to why it was operating later and the son took it over and it did become more of like a military school, Um, but still with the switches and with everything else. So it was still a a horrible occurrence. There's there's no worse, better anything for anybody and everybody's story and everybody's situation is different. So... And, and that's what I hate. I hate when I see people online or anywhere else try to make this into a pissing match because it's not about who had it worse or not. It's all just as bad. In fact, what got me through all of this, and people have always asked me, the few people I've spoken to about what happened to me here and what you guys will hear later, some of the worst parts, was that I knew somewhere in the world, 
Someone else had it worse than I did at that moment. Somebody else literally had it worse. And I'm talking about even up to death at that moment. That's how bad it was just to prepare some people. So, um, yeah. And, you know, you also want to say to be careful with your, with your parents, if your kids, it is so hard for them to understand and to identify. Um, and I'm sure a lot of times they, you know, they're trying to do the best that they can. Again, mine, the generation gap was so large. They had no clue what was going on. They didn't need to send me to this place at all. I would have been perfectly fine. Um, and then we couldn't even deal with it afterwards. That's something that, that we'll discuss on another episode because you're going to help you with that on maybe how to do it and then get therapy and talk to them on how to do it and discuss this with your family because it really is a family matter. It is something that you need to get out and deal with with your family and not put blame on them because if you'd live with that your whole life, you're really only hurting yourself. Does that make sense, Jessica? I mean, kind of, you know, Absolutely. if you live with the fear and you hate, hate especially, if you live with that, you're just hurting yourself, you know, because you can't get to them. Believe me, my mind had wandered to places <laughs> of what I would love to do. But, you know, that's, you know, it. Because I'm a good person, you know, I'm not a bad person. There's a you know, difference between myself and the fountains and all the other people that were in charge of, of this place. This was on 60 Minutes, people. This was on 2020. That's how big it was at the time with Barbara Walters. You can look all this up. Um, I think there was a big article in the New York lot. Times also. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Good one. Good one. A good New York Times write-up. Uh, in video, I think, in video. Um, so there is. There's lots of information out there, guys. Just take it again, some of it with a grain of salt. So take whatever you're seeing and hearing it and multiply it by 100, especially if it's fountain talking or doing anything else. Um, and then they did have the congressional hearings. They did have the raid. But again, you know, with the states and powerful people, you got to think of today of what's going on right now. There's a lot of big uh, sex rings, pedophilia rings being busted as we speak, but you don't hear about it in the news. Why? Um, I don't know. Yeah, and this is very hurtful. You don't hear about it. It's a shame. Uh, for some reason, the mainstream news doesn't want us to know about how many pedophilia rings there are out there and these WASP programs. There's uh, a I can't remember. I wrote it down. There's like 1,300. I mean, there's they're all over the world and all over the United States. And when children become missing, that's all I'm going to say. You, can, you guys can fill in the blanks, um, you know, so I don't have to continually do this whole ordeal. <laughs> I'll, you know, go allegedly and you know this and that. You can just think about it on your own and let your let your mind go where I'm sure it will. Um, and, you know, that can be your own truth. Um, it's my truth. And I'm allowed to say it because it occurred to me. It occurred to me. So please, people, please uh, contact us. Um, and again, it's going to play in the outro again. So write it down, the information, and uh, get in touch with us. Um We'd like to be on another round and talk because we do. We want to be able to get as much information out to people as possible. That's accurate information. And, and, and again, setting things straight, timelines. Um, again, with some of the other uh, people, again, that were in charge um, that I'm bad at, uh, again, with, with, the, with the names. So I'm going to try to get the gentleman, Michael, back on with us. Um, and then I will probably also have a, a possibly a separate show with um alan and his book because it is different so we'll probably handle that in a different way so jessica you want any anything you want to say in closing yeah i was just going to say even if uh anybody wants to contact uh the email address that you spoke of even if they want to talk even if they don't want to be recognized and they just want someone to listen exactly. to them, exactly. uh, this is it's about healing um and yeah, part of like that is a lot of the girls' side too, because um, a lot of the guys, the boys' side is out there, but not a ton of of the girls that were there. So.
So, yeah. Um, so like I said, folks, we, we really just wanted to keep this as tame as possible. Um, just, you know, explain what cults are, hopefully in what we talked about. And this is unscripted. We don't have scripts in front of us, people. Okay. Uh, other than what I read from the articles. So the things that we're talking about, and as I mentioned, we were literally filling in our own sentences. And with the gentleman, Mike, who unfortunately couldn't make it, I'll get him back on. He was doing the same thing. So everything you're hearing happened in the way that it did. And we have to make sure it never happens again. And with that, we're going to say goodbye. Uh, just plan on hearing. Uh, we'll put out over Twitter and Facebook when the uh, next episode is going to come out. There may be some other things that I do in between because we've got to do more and more research. This is very deep. It's a lot of work, people. A lot of work. And in fact, I'd appreciate it if people would help us through Patreon. We put it out there every time. Uh, I know, you know, we, we've got, you know, few thousand listeners. We're not massive yet. I didn't start that long ago, but I know that we've got a decent number of listeners already. And, um, you know, this does cost, it's not easy to do. We're not looking to get rich or, um, this isn't my job. I, you know, I have a travel tech company. That's my retirement. Okay. <laughs> it's not podcasting, but I got to pay the bills. Like, you know, I, this stuff costs, you know, everybody does it. So I just want you guys to take that into consideration that I'm independent. I am not what's called a big box producer. And unfortunately, I hear people that give, and they can, it's okay, but it's just unfortunate. They give money to these big, and I'm not going to name them, but that's not fair either. I'm not going to out them, but everybody knows who they are. They're, they're big production companies that do podcasts. They have millions of dollars, people. <laughs> They don't need any money. They, they've got like 10 people on staff to do this stuff. And this is basically myself and, and one other person I love to death. It helps me a little bit on, on social media. And I'm working on a few people I might add uh, in as guest hosts as well coming up soon, which I hope they go for it because if they do, it's going to be really cool. And then when we do these episodes, of course, Jessica, right? If she'll, if you'll have us, right, Jessica, you'll be on. Oh, absolutely. For everyone. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Let's say goodbye. Everybody Talk have soon. a, yeah. Good night and take it light. If you guys, uh, again, did go to Bethel, don't let anything bother you, you know, just heal and get through this. Peace out. Thanks for listening. And hopefully you've added something to your knowledge base. Subscribe now and please give us a five-star rating. Spread the love and feel free to leave a kind written review for us. Your humble hosts gain knowledge after every episode. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Pull Up A Pew Podcast. That's P-U-L-L-U-P-A-P-E-W podcast. Again, Facebook and Instagram at Pull Up A Pew podcast. P-U-L-L-U-P-A-P-E-W podcast. And Twitter at Pull Up A Pew. Again, P-U-L-L-U-P-A-P-E-W. Twitter at Pull Up A Pew. Please also consider supporting us through Patreon with anything you feel you can afford at patreon.com slash pull up a pew. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash pull up a pew. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash P-U-L-L-U-P-A-P-E-W. We will also be doing shows and supporting The Innocence Project. There can be no greater crime or misery than having your liberty and freedom taken away knowing you're innocent. So thanks for listening. And if you're a new podcaster and want to have advantages we can offer you through our partnership with Asander Production and Worldwide Motion Pictures, then email us at info at pullupapewpodcast.com. That's pullupapew, P-U-L-L. U P A P E W podcast dot com. <laughs>